that started uh, with the uh, last <laughs> lecture on resource analysis. So um, last time we've seen how the type inference for this linear system works, so you can fully automatically derive resource bounds using LP solving. Um, and this is all implemented in uh, the programming language resource aware ML. Um, and in resource aware ML, we actually uh, are more powerful, we can derive polynomial bounds. And this is um, what we're gonna see a little bit of today. Um, so today we're gonna look at univariate polynomial bounds. So these are things like you know n squared, m squared, and in resource aware ML, uh, we actually have multivariate polynomial bounds. So you can also have things like you know m squared times n, and um, you can also have user-defined data types. Yeah, that's also something we didn't talk about here. We just do it for lists, but in resource aware ML, you have user-defined inductive types. Um, resource aware ML, we uh, also have higher order functions, exceptions. Um, and uh, references and arrays, also things we, we didn't talk about. Um, so I thought I'd uh, show you a little demo on how that goes. So um, the yeah, resource aware ML is implemented on top of a camel, so you have a camel syntax. So here um, you see uh, this example. Uh, we looked at uh, in, in the uh, class yesterday, append, and so what you can do now is you can say, okay, um, analyze this function uh, using a given resource metric. So the resource metric um, I use here is um, number of evaluation steps and the big step semantics. So here you see the result of the um, analysis for a pen. So one thing you notice is you have to give it a, a maximal degree. So here I said like, yeah, look for bounds um, with degree four. Um, um, but still it finds a linear bound. So you can um, um, give a degree that's too high, yeah, it will still uh, find a, a tight bound in most cases. So um, what you see here, these are the uh, so-called uh, potential annotations. So um, they are attached um, to the list in, or to, to the um, arguments of the function functions to the like pairs of lists here in a, a kind of like global way. So in this linear system, you have uh, one annotation on each list type. Yeah, and here in resource aware ML, you have a type and then you have a global annotation where you have a coefficient for n squared and you have one for n times m and so on. And uh, what, what it tells you here is what these coefficients are. And then it also gives you like a, a readable version of this thing and it says like nine times m plus three where m is the number of cons nodes in the first uh, component of the argument. So basically uh, nine times blanks of the first list plus three. That's the, the bound we derive. So what we can also do now is um, one thing I want to show you is so you can insert these tick commands, so if you wanna do the same thing we did in the lecture, and you wanna say like bound the number of cons operations, then you can analyze the code uh, using uh, the tick metric. You say it's, it's pretty fast, um, 0.05 seconds. Um, and so what you get then is what you expect, one times length of the first list. So that's the thing you've seen in the class yesterday. So and the inference for this like linear thing works exactly the way as you've seen it yesterday. So, but now we can of course do also like more interesting things. So here um, you see an implementation of quicksort. So you just have the partition function that um, is higher order by the way. So it takes like this um, partition um, um, function f uh, that you use to decide okay if f is true then f of x is true, then you put it into the um, right-hand list, and if it's false, you put it in the left-hand list. And then the quicksort is also a higher order function, so it has this comparison function, uh, gt here, greater, um, and so you pass, you take uh, this pivot element x here, and then um, you take this gtx as your comparison function. And then, yeah, you, uh, quicksort recursively, this pivot thing goes in the middle and you append uh, everything. So we can run that and let's say we wanna get the 
number of evaluation steps. So um, you see it's pretty fast. And uh, what you get here is um, a quadratic bound, as you would expect. So one thing that's interesting here is um, that we, of course, don't know what this um, comparison function would be. So this comparison might be very expensive. Yeah, if you kind of like want to sort a list of strings, it might be linear, or it might be even worse if you, if you uh, sort more complicated data. So one way to deal with that would be to derive kind of like a parametric bound that would say like kind of, okay, the, the, um, if you know, the cost of this comparison is this, then the global bound is that. Um, but that's not what we do. What we do here is um, we just assume that the cost for this comparison is zero um, and just give you for the quick sort the uh, cost of yeah, kind of like the rest of the function. If you use quicksort later on with a concrete comparison, then you get the bound with respect to that functional argument. The reason we do it like that is mainly because it's very hard to, um, in general, um, yeah, um, 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 give these parametric bounds because like your higher order argument might be used on you know, some intermediate data in, 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 in the code, and then it's very hard to express that. Um, and it's very hard to read for, for a user. So what we do is we yeah, just do it like that. Um, one thing that's interesting, we can now also like derive a bound on the number of ticks. So remember, um, we put um, in this like tick one in the um, append, and uh, we use the append here in the quick sort. And now you get again a bound on the number of ticks here that is quadratic in the list. And you see that you have this um, negative coefficient here for the linear part, and that um, comes from the basis we use. So we, as, a, as a, the, the basis of our polynomials, we use n choose 2, uh, which helps us to express bounds that are tighter than if you would just use the regular basis with non-negative coefficients. And it also, you'll see today, um, these binomials have also nice properties that help us. Okay, so what you can also do is um, have user-defined types. So here um, I have a list that has um, A cons and B cons constructors, so two different types of nodes that can also have different types. So um, yeah, the analysis is also uh, works also for uh, polymorphic programs, by the way. So and what we have then here is a map function, so it works very similar to the map on regular lists. Here the difference is that you have two uh, functional arguments, or higher order arguments, f and g. So an f is applied to all the a nodes, and g is applied to all the b nodes. So we can run that now and um, get again um, um, a bound on the number of steps. And you can see here um, that uh, now this output that, you, that we got for, for the uh, list makes bit more sense because now you see that the bound is given um, um, with respect to the number of B cons nodes, M, and the number of A cons nodes, N. And you can, of course, have like different cost if you give it different higher order arguments. So let's see how that looks for, for a concrete example. So here, uh, let's say we give it quick sort um, for the A cons nodes. And so, yeah, there, of course, like yeah, you have a, 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 in the ACONS nodes, you store lists of some kind, yeah, uh, that you're going to all sort with quicksort. And in the BCONS nodes, you can have whatever, and it's just the identity function here. So we can run the um, analysis, and you see it's still pretty fast, and the bound you get um, gets already fairly complex. Um, but what you see here is, um, L is the number of B cons nodes, and what we do for the B cons nodes is just um, linear, okay? Because we just apply the identity function to all the data in the B cons nodes. And um, what you get for the um, A cons nodes is something that is quadratic, namely this k square in the lists that are stored in the A cons nodes, and you have that for every a cons node, so you have k squared times n. 
Uh, so you can see that more clearly if we just run the analysis again with the uh, tick bounds, hopefully. So there, um, yeah, you see exactly the same bound you have seen before for quicksort here, right? So this like minus 0.5 and plus 0.5 thing. Yeah, this um, um, here in this case, K choose two. And now you have this times N where n is the number of the acorns nodes. So this is, of course, a very precise bound for, 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 for this function. OK, so um, what we can also have is um, exceptions. So if we have like the um, evaluation step bounds again for this um, a sort prime here. So a sort prime is the same thing as the a sort, except that we replace the identity function with a function that just uh, throws an exception here. Um, and that means um, kind of like the evaluation stops um, if we hit a beacons node in the list. Okay, and this is reflected on the bounds. The resource aware now can understand that. So here in this bound, uh, this linear factor, this L um, that you've seen before, the number of beacons nodes is missing in the bound. So it understands that it uh, the, the cost only depends on the number of acorns nodes. And if it has a beacons node, yeah, it, it, it'll stop right away. So, um, yeah, you can see that here again um, when we just like, yeah, the same thing a bit simpler is when we get the number of ticks for this function B tick that just has like tick. Uh, so it basically applies the identity function to the acorns and beacons nodes. But for the beacons nodes, it executes this uh, tick command here. So what you get then is about 2.5 times m, where m is the number of beacons nodes. So yeah, so the, the acorns nodes don't matter. OK, good. So yeah, there I have a, a, a bit more a complicated stuff here. This is a nested fold on, on these lists, but I think the uh, General idea um, became clear. Questions? Yes. So with the, uh, with the quick sort example, could you wrap greater than in another function that assigned a tick to its application and then at least spell out how many applications greater than there were in the sort? Yes, we, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so the question was if we, if, if we have like a way to find out how many times these higher order arguments are applied, and the answer is yes, we can of course have a tick inside and then um, um, count this, yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yes, so and that's exactly what we do. So when you, um, so the question was like, yeah. So when we have inner data structures, when we get the uh, bound on that, let's see what we have here. Yeah. So here you see that um, k is the maximum number of cons nodes uh, in the a cons nodes of the second component. Um, so the question is, can we be more precise and not have this like, yeah, um, um, not abstract the inner sizes with uh, the, the maximal number? And um, yeah, we only do that, in fact, um, at the output at the end of the day. So the analysis is precise enough to account for each individual size of the inner data structures. So um, you see that already for the um, linear type system. So there uh, you have, if you have a list of lists, then you have an annotation also, of course, on the type for the inner lists. And that means you have a potential for each list element of the inner lists. Kind of like, and this takes into account kind of like the sum of all the inner lists. And for the polynomial analysis, it's the same thing. Only when we report the bound to, and it's important to have this to, um, um, get good results in, in larger programs. Um, and only at the end of the day when we report the bound to the user, we um, um, give this kind of like simplified bound here. So um, 
you can see this, for instance, I think it shows up here. This is the, no, ah, uh, yeah. No, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not obvious because um, you have to make this conversion to from the binomial basis to the standard basis. So that's what we do here. So what you have here is 35 minus 14, which is, yeah, 21, hopefully, exactly. So the 14 is kind of like this negative factor that you get from the n choose 2. Um, so that gives you the, the 21 here. But what this means here, basically, the 35 is exactly what it would mean in the linear system. So there you have kind of like 35 resource units for every cons in the lists of the A cons. Yeah. And then we just kind of like <coughs> simplify that with this like yeah, K times N thing at, at the end of the day. Could like, yeah, could also like write something different here for, for the user, but we thought like it's the easiest way to output it. <coughs> yes? All of the solutions are integers, is that just happy coincidence or are they guaranteed to be IIT? Um, no, uh, they're, they're, they're not. Um, so, um, so the question is, um, are they always like integers, the solution here? And the answer is like no. Even we have seen examples, let's see, uh, in, the, in, the, in the quick sort where you had the 0.5 Somewhere, I think, yeah, we have to use the ticks there, you, it showed up. Uh, yeah, so here you, here you see it. Well, it's true that we still have a, 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 an integer up here, um, so that's unfortunate. So we only get the 0 0.5 when we do the conversion. But, um, so you can think of something um, kind of like a compress function, okay, where you um, match on two elements of the list, and then you know you do something that has cost one, okay? And then um, the potential you want to have is 0.5 per list element because you always get out then 0.5, 0.5. You have one, and then you pay for the cost. So it's it's um, quite it's not kind of like a um, um, uh, only for efficiency that we allow the um, rational solutions. It, it really makes sense for for some programs. Okay, good. So um, that's resource aware ML. Um, you can also use that online um, on the website. I think it's um, posted somewhere on the um, 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 Piazza already. Um, the, the website is, yeah, I'll, I can write it on the board too. It's um, raml.co. Um, and so you don't have to install it to, to play with it. You can just use the web interface. Okay, let me think. Yeah, I think that was all I wanted to show you. Okay, so today um, we're going to look at the polynomial potential. So, yeah, but only the um, univariate version where you can have things like you know n to the three, but not n times m. Um, so the the system will be um, very very similar to the uh, linear one. So I will only talk about the differences. So most rules will stay exactly the same, um, and what will of course change are the potential annotations. So um, in the linear system, you only had one number per list. And now in the univariate system, you will have a vector, okay? And this is an extension of the linear system in the sense that, okay, there's still like a, a linear factor, 
that is the same as um, in, 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 in the linear version, but there's now also like a one coefficient for the quadratic, cubic, and so on. So um, the annotated types here um, look very similar to the linear version. So we have the uh, booleans. Um, we have the lists, and uh, we have the pairs, and for the lists, we have a vector of non-negative rational numbers. Okay, and so of course we have to say what the meaning is. But before we do that, um, so um, we kind of like have to say um, what we do in the pattern matching. So um, in the linear case, what happened, if you remember, is that you got this constant spill. Uh, when you did a pattern matching that you could, that was attached to the head of the list. And for the polynomial case, we can't just do it with a constant spill, we kind of like need a polynomial spill. So if you have something quadratic um, assigned to a list and the list gets smaller, then um, for kind of like the smaller list, you get a linear spill, okay? In the same way as for the, for the linear potential, you got a constant spill. Okay, and what the spill is, we define that first, and we call it the additive shift. So the additive shift takes such an annotation Q here. Now we write it like this with this triangle. And it adds to the Q0, the linear part, and it adds to the linear part, the quadratic part, and so on. In the end, you have K minus 1 plus QK and QK. So of course, uh, since we're interested in automation, um, we are also like in the system where we actually would like to do a, a manual analysis. We assume that like these annotations are always finite, okay? And that means um, you only talk about uh, bounds up to um, degree k in this case, yeah, if you have k annotations. So um, yeah, you'll see what that means um, in, a, in, a, in a second, so now we define the potential, okay, um, using this shift operation. So let um, A be a value of type A. And the potential is defined as follows. So if it's um, if A is a Boolean. then the potential is again zero. Okay. Same as before for the linear version. So if A is a pair, A1, A2 of type A1 star A2, 
then um, the potential of this pair is simply the potential of A1 on a type A1 plus A2 uh, on a type A2. Okay, also exactly the same thing as before. And now, of course, the interesting part is, okay, if we have a list, A1, AN, with this annotation, vector Q, and the elements are of type A, so then the potential is uh, Q1, plus the potential that is assigned to uh, A1. Uh, maybe let me write that differently, sorry. Uh, so we say we have a list with first element L and uh, A and tail L, okay? So then we have Q1, yeah, basically that's like in the linear system, that was kind of like the linear potential uh, that is assigned to A. Then we have the potential of A, and then we have uh, the potential of the tail, yeah, but in order to get something quadratic, um, what we have to do is we have to here use this shift operation. Okay, so um, let's look what this. Um, uh, let's look at this definition and see um, what it gives us um, for a few examples. So, so let's say we have a list L uh, with n elements. And now we have a type that has just um, the linear factor, okay? Just let's say, um, um, what do we do here? Yeah, we look at cubic at the most, so we just have three of them. Um, okay, it has just the Q1, and then it would have like zeros here in the quadratic part and the cubic part. Okay, and let's say we just have booleans here. Okay, so what is the potential of this? So we look at the definition and um, we say like, okay, what we get is for, for this list, well, we have for the um, A1, kind of like we get this Q1 here and then um, we have the potential of A because it's a Boolean at zero, and then we have the potential of this list under this shift operation. Okay, so the shift operation, what it does is it takes um, all the things on the right and adds it to the stuff on the left. So, um, uh, uh, what, what will happen is because all these like higher ones are zero, the shift just doesn't change anything. Yeah, question. Oh yeah, that's a, a good question. Yeah, it should rather start from one. So um, do a yeah do a plus one here, but it's just yeah th that doesn't matter much. But it's it's better like if we start with one. Oh yeah, yeah, right. That's a good point, yeah. So we have to start with one here too. This can stay. Okay, so start with one, two, 
two, three. Yeah, right. Okay, so uh, what's the potential then of this thing? Anybody? Q1 plus? Sure, that's kind of like the unrolling of the definition, but what does it give us in total? Yes, Q1 times length of the list. Now you see that? So maybe we do it like that, so we unroll the, the definition once, right? So we get Q1 plus the potential of A1 on the bool plus the potential of this list starting from A2 to N under this shifted potential. But in this case, the shift will not change anything. Okay, so we get the same <coughs> annotation here. And then if you just like unroll this recursive definition, Okay, so you get just uh, Q1 times N. Okay, good. So now um, the next one. So the next one we have, uh, let's say, a quadratic annotation. So we have Q0, Q2, uh, 0, Q2, and a 0 again. So what do we get here? So we get, um, well, Q1 is zero, so we get zero plus the potential of A1 on the bool, which is still zero. And now something happens here in the shift operation, okay? In the shift operation, um, we get this quadratic potential that falls down to the linear part, okay? So we have here um, our Q2 in the linear position and the Q2 is still in the quadratic position and zero here. Oops. Sorry. So we have the tail of the list first. And then we have this type where we applied the shift operation. So the Q2, Q2, 0, bool. Okay, so, and this, basically uh, we um, kind of like know what it is already. Um, because we have this um, kind of like linear part here, yeah, which um, is in this case um, Q2 times N minus 1. Okay, this is 0. This um, um, A1 part is 0. Um, plus phi, uh, phi of the tail of the list. under zero, Q2, zero, bool. Okay, so what this basically tells you is that you have uh, some linear potential for every sublist of the list, yeah? So you have a Q2 times I, where I is the length of a sublist of the original list. Okay, so what you get is basically uh, sum where um, i is basically ranges over all the uh, sublists, yeah, smaller than n, um, and then you have this q2 times i, and this is simply 
and choose two. Oh, times Q2, of course. <coughs> yeah, so this gives you a quadratic potential. And this continues like that. So for the um, uh, continuing the examples here, so if you have now like the cubic part, <coughs> Q3 here, then you get N choose 3 times Q3. Okay, and we define it, so I mean you can define it also like in a different way, we'll see in, in, a, in a moment with a, a lemma, but um, I like to define the, the potential like this because it already hints um, at the type rule you're gonna have for the cons and for the match. And you see kind of like how you can operate with this um, with using um, LP solving uh, only. Um, so, so that's why we set it up like that. So you have this very nice property of the binomials. Yeah, that like if you um, if you do if, if you start with n and you have these binomial coefficients and then you have n minus one, then um, it's very easy to kind of like come up with a potential annotation for this data structure of n minus one um, with so that you don't lose any potential. And that's exactly what this shift operation does. So, um, okay, another definition. So, um, we define small phi of n and um, q to be simply the sum from 1 to k and over i. Ui, and then we can prove a lemma. Maybe I can squeeze it in here. Um, okay, and this lemma um, tells us what the potential is um, of a of a list type. Um, we could also use that at, as the definition of the potential. Um, doesn't matter. So uh, let again L uh, be a list A1 to AN um, of type A. So the elements are of type A. Um, and Let uh, Q equals Q1 to QK, non negative rational numbers as usual. Um, so then the potential of the list L with the annotation Q. is um, small phi of n q plus the sum of the potentials assigned to the elements of the list yeah under type a so that's basically a generalization of these examples yeah, that, that you've seen. Um, it just tells you like the, yeah, the um, um, annotation Q1 here is the linear part as before. Um, um, the annotation Q2 is the quadratic part as before. And then of course you have the, um, all this inner potential. Yeah, we had a question about that 
earlier, um, where you take into account all the individual sizes of the inner lists. Yeah, this is done in, in this sum here. Okay, so I want to show you more lemmas. Maybe not questions so far. Okay, so maybe um, let's look before we get to the type rules, let's look at an example again. So here I am going to define a function um, pairs. that takes a list and um, returns um, a list of the ordered pairs in the original list. So the size of the output um, will be quadratic and also the number of cons operations that we do. So we look at the number of cons operations again as our resource metric um, and this um, will also be quadratic. So match Access with empty list is just empty. Otherwise, well, maybe let me leave a little bit more space here. Empty. So what we want to do now is we want to recursively, or probably we start uh, like I wrote it down <coughs> earlier. So first we call a helper function attach uh, that I'm not going to define, it just takes um, uh, list element, say a bool, and uh, list, and uh, creates pairs um, so that um, um, x is always the first element of the pair, and the elements of this list here are the um, um, second components of the pair. So then we do a recursive call and create all the pairs that are in the tail of the list. And then uh, we append uh, the pairs with the x in front to the pairs we got from the recursive call. Okay, so is that uh, about clear what this function does? Yeah, should, should I define the uh, attach function? Or is it clear? So for instance, so example, so if you have pairs of a list one, two, three, then you get um, one, two, one, three, and two, three. So then it's clear what, what attach does, right? I mean, it's just a function that goes through the list and attaches the x to everything. Okay, good. So, um, Okay, let's look at the types first we assign to this. So um, again, we count the number of uh, cons operations. So for the um, attach, I mean, you don't see the code, um, but I'm just gonna tell you how it, how it looks. So um, it takes a Boolean uh, 
takes a Boolean and a list of Booleans and returns a list of pairs of Booleans Okay, and the list has the uh, same size. So, yeah, the type um, we could assign to it. So again, we uh, count the number of cons operations, okay? Um, so here um, we have zero, zero again, and one type we could use is that we just have one here and uh, zero here, okay? Then we would count for all the, the operations, the potential is gone. But in this particular function, I claim it's better to use this type where we have two here, then we use up one of the two, um, and we have uh, one left here. Okay, and for the append, oh yeah, and also of course we now are in this um, setting where we have vectors up here. Um, so, but I claim here we can just ignore the quadratic part. Yeah, let's just have linear and quadratic annotations, and we can put zero here. Yeah, this is um, um, certainly sound um, because yeah, all this these like new annotations are zero. So um, yeah, the the um, type means essentially the same thing as the old linear type that you already understand. So for the append, we can do the same thing. So here um, we have two input lists and one output list and they're uh, same thing so we just use a type that you know already um, and um, the quadratic part is just zero so here we have zero, <coughs> zero Okay, so how many cons operations do we execute here um, in this pairs function as a function of the size of the input list? So that's the first question. So for every sublist um, in this execution, basically, uh, what's going to happen? So we have first, like, the cost of the cons operations and that the attach here, yeah, which is number, uh, or, or like, which is given by the length of the sublist here, okay? And then we also have number of cons operations that is given here by t, okay, in every recursive call, but the size of t or the length of t is simply uh, the length of the axis prime here, okay? So for every sublist um, in this original <coughs> list, we're going to have two cons operations per element in the sublist, okay? So, um, Number of cons operations, cons ops in pairs axis is simply two times size of the list, choose two. Okay, so that's already not so easy to prove actually. Okay, but yeah, we can do that even automatically. And if you see now how we reason about it in the type system, it makes it helps you even to understand why why this is true. Okay, so the type we have for pairs now is well we want to exactly express this bound here with our potential function. Okay, so um, what do we have to put in, in the vector? So 
So what is the linear factor? Zero. Zero, yep, that's right. What is the Anschluss two factor? Two. two, exactly. There you go. Okay, the constants are zero again, and in the end, our potential will be used up. So, let's see how we can justify this. Uh, maybe use red. So, at the beginning here, we start with a context where we have our axis, and the annotation is as given by the arguments. Yeah. So let me just leave out the bool here um, because I run out of space. And we also have this um, constant potential, or let me write it as we do it in the type derivation, yeah, um, where we have zero and zero yeah, as given by this function type. Okay, and in the end, what we want to have here is L zero, zero. Is, is that um, okay to read with the red? Yeah, question? Sorry, minor correction. Um, so shouldn't we be returning bools to our bools, um, both pairs and the pens? Oh, yeah. Pens should all be bool squares. And That's right, absolutely, yeah. So it doesn't change anything for our type analysis, but um, let's call this thing a boo. <laughs> oh yeah, I could also just write square, but yeah, so where boo is boo <laughs> star boo. Okay. Yep. That's how you write the best programs. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, yeah, very good point. So it's a, um, with the red, is that okay to read? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> so what happens here is super easy because we have an empty <laughs> context and um, return an empty list. So we have zero potential and we want to return zero potential. And here, that's the same thing as for the linear type system. Here we can just put whatever, but um, we don't even need much. We just need zero, zero. Yeah, I learned that um, Boolean here. I'll leave it conveniently out so then I don't get confused with the with the types. Okay, more interestingly is, of course, like the thing that happens down here in the, in the match case, and the cons case. Here what we have in the context is um, x, which has type bool, and we have this x as prime, where we use this shift operation. So and the shift gives us here 2, 2. Okay, so this is kind of like this linear spill we can now use uh, to pay um, for the cost. Ah, yeah, I forgot something. So here the problem is we use the axis prime twice. Okay, so we have to use our sharing operation to allow this. So let me squeeze that in here. So this is the uh, axis prime one, this is the axis prime two here, and what we have to add here is share um, 
x is prime as x is prime 1 x is prime 2 in yeah so the thing I wrote here has now to go one up um, maybe uh, how can I save this so x is prime has like this two two here so okay so what we have here now is we have one more thing in the context so we have the x is one and uh, we have the x is prime two which has also like this uh, list annotation. Okay, and what we have to do is we have to share the potential between the two occurrences. And how are we gonna do that? Well, for the attach for the x is one here, um, what do we need in the, in the argument type? So we need the two is zero because we have to pay for the linear cost, okay? So what's gonna happen is we're gonna put like two uh, zero here and what we have left over then is the quadratic part, 0, 2, that we put here. Okay, so you can share this potential like you have seen in the linear. Yeah, you um, could like just like split up the potential, and you can do the same here. You can split it up point-wise. As a coincidence here, yeah, we don't sp split much um, 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 per point. Yeah, we just like take the whole quadratic one and assign it to this x is two, and we take the whole linear one and assign it to the x is one. But we can do that, that's one way of splitting it. Yeah, and um, it's, it's pretty clear that we have to do it like that because here for the x is one, that's exactly the type we need. And for the x is two, we do the recursive call of a pen. So as a nice coincidence, that's also exactly what we need here. So, okay, so as a, a return type of this attach here, um, what we get is um, what's written there, namely this L10, uh, and you can already see that that's a, a, a very good thing because that's exactly this type of T that we need here to feed it into the pant. Okay, that's also a good fit. So, okay, what we have here then um, in the uh, next slide is um, just the, uh, well, yeah, I don't know how to write that anymore. Um, so um, let me maybe just say like, okay, that like, uh, um, um, we use this um, axis two prime here to feed it into the pairs, yeah, and what we get here in, in return is what the, um, what the uh, type of pairs tells us here, namely zero, zero, okay? And then we have exactly the right stuff for the uh, append here as required by its type, and we have justified the whole thing. Pretty magical. Okay, and we could do that um, because, um, yeah, we uh, kind of like have this lemma here that says kind of like, okay, the, the um, potential uh, that we have in the end when we treat things like that and with this like shift operation is actually this um, n choose two. So you could do it the other way around you can say like, okay, I define the potential in this way that the quadratic part is the n choose two. And then you can go and prove that when you have this shift operation here, 
and you use it in the pattern match as we have done where we move the two over that this is sound okay that's a different way of, of setting it up so so but it's it's equivalent obviously okay so with this um, intuition let's look at the type rules and there are really only two or three rules maybe um, that change so. So and the rules that change are only the rules that involve lists. But the rule for nil does not change a lot. So um, let's start with that one. So we have again our type judgments here. So I'm not going to say this. They look exactly the same as in the linear system only that you have, um, um, yeah, as we defined it here now, the vectors um, attached to, to the list. So the type judgment is exactly the same. So okay, for the um, nil case, it basically looks the same as before, but now you can just assign an arbitrary vector here to the list. And of course, as before, you have to pay for the cost. So the uh, Q is uh, the cost of nil plus Q prime. Okay. So for the cons case, it gets a little bit um, more interesting. So here um, we have again our sigma, um, then we have uh, an x1 of type A and an x2 of a list type of A, Q, Q prime, and then we have our cons operation x1, x2 um, of type L of A. So now we assume, um, as always, that like this P is a vector uh, P1, Pk, and um, what we have to pay for is, of course, um, like before, the cost of the cons and the linear annotation that we um, assign to the um, head of the list and the potential uh, that remains. So in here we have the annotation vector P, I forgot to say. So the question is, what do we have to put now on the annotation of the tail here, on the list annotation here? OK? So and what we need there is, of course, the annotation has to get bigger, yeah? so that we are able um, to um, 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 uh, account for uh, this longer list here. Yeah? If you would just put vector p here, it would be not sufficient, okay? Because then um, you have uh, something here uh, that's a little bit longer, yeah? So you have, for instance, for the quadratic potential, you would have like n plus 1 choose 2, and here you would only have n choose 2, 
Okay, so you need this kind of like spill yeah, that you have to add to the annotation. So you have to have the shift operation of the vector p here. So and that's it. That's the rule. <coughs> Looks a bit strange. It's kind of like more um, intuitive for the match where it goes the other way around, where you kind of like get the spill. But um, if you think about it, it's really just the same thing for, for the cons. Yeah. But you, you could also set it up where you can find like the, the, the inverse of that editor shift and put that on the right. Yes, side. exactly. That would be also possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I somehow yeah don't I, I prefer to do it like this because then you don't have any side conditions kind of like that things have to be non negative. Right. So that's the, 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 the reason to do it like that. Yeah, but you could also, there was the question, also have like an inverse operation and then inverse shift and then um, put it here on the right hand side. Yeah, that would probably be a bit more intuitive to do. Okay, so now the uh, last rule that, that changes, um, that's a, a match rule. So here uh, we have again our sigma gamma, and then um, our x list type that we match on. Uh -oh. uh, q, q prime, here I can already put vector p. Um, and then we have the match x uh, e1, x1, x2, Two type B. Okay, so um, again the vector P is P one PK um, and the um, Typing of the E1 does not change, so that's like in the um, linear case. We just use our gamma um, and have a Q1, Q prime, type the E1 and get B. And the uh, Q has to be sufficient to um, pay for the uh, Q1 and the um, match in the cons case. So yeah, that's exactly um, um, like it was in the linear case, same thing. Okay, but now for the um, E2, it gets more interesting. So here um, we have sigma, gamma, we get the x1 of type A, we get the x2, list of A, and we get uh, Q2, Q prime, E2, B. And now what we have to do is we, uh, the list gets shorter, so the annotations have to be a little bit more again, okay? So we have our shift operation here, vector P, and um, of course, what we also have in, in the match rule, as in the cons uh, rule, we have this interaction between the um, linear part and the constant part again that will allow us to do this very local reasoning. So here, uh, same as before, we can use, um, let me write it like I did here on the, on the rules. So we can use, um, sorry, there's not so much space here, the Q and the P1 to pay for the Q2 um, plus the cost. Okay, so this part is also like the same as for the linear case. So the only thing that changes really is that we add these shift operations um, to the lists that kind of like account for this spill. And so the interesting thing is that um, 
This works in the exactly same way also for the multivariate case, where you, uh, so they're like the types, um, uh, yeah, look a bit complicated, but it's exactly the same thing, because the math is, does not change if you, if you have the same kind of reasoning, but you multiply it with a constant, so to speak, okay? Think of like um, you would have a, a similar potential here um, um, that is kind of like multiplied with some size that's hidden here in the gamma, okay? So the gamma does not change um, um, while you go from, from the match here inside um, 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 this cons case yeah, and you do the E2. So um, you can simply take some like yeah, size here, you know, size of some list that is hidden in gamma and multiply it um, um, with the whole thing. And um, um, it, not much happens there. So the only thing um, that, that is complicated there is that you have to deal with a lot of sizes and there, there are a few other um, um, uh, things involved. So what we did for the multivariate case is we um, pulled the type annotations out from the data types and just attached it to the side of a type. So you have kind of like a, a base type uh, without any annotations and then you have a, um, a annotation so just like this. So you have a type T without any annotations and then you have a big Q um, uh, that contains all these like small Qs that you've seen here. Yeah, so T might be like a pair of lists and then you have like two vectors um, uh, inside this a big Q here. But you also have these like mixed things and so on and so forth. And you also have then like a shift operation um, that you do on this big Q and so on and so forth. And um, it's essentially the same thing again for the multivariate. Now, there are a few challenges involved, but the idea is exactly the same. And the math is a bit more complicated. And the same surprisingly is true when it comes to these user-defined data structures that you've seen in the demo earlier. So the same thing, um, um, things um, actually don't get much more complicated than um, uh, it is for lists, but you have again like this shift operation, so you have a different shift for each um, constructor in, in your data structure, and so it's uh, the same idea, basically. Okay, good. Um, any more questions about this shift business? So um, there are um, more rules that change a little bit. So the, well, the rules stay the same, but um, what we of course have to define is uh, the subtyping and the sharing. Um, again, now for um, these more complex annotations, and I mentioned it already, um, that we just do it point-wise. So, yeah, you have the, uh, I think, complete set of type rules on um, today's homework that I haven't uploaded yet, but um, I will do that before lunch. Um, so you, you have them. Um, and yeah, you will see like the, the rules for the subtyping look exactly like in the linear system, but the subtyping relation, um, we uh, define it a bit differently. So another definition, uh, subtyping. Yeah, it's, it's like in the linear system, but of course we have to um, now account for the situation that we have the vectors. So uh, bool is a subtype of bool um, as usual. Um, the um, A1, A2 is a subtype of uh, B1 star B2. If A1 is a subtype of B1, and um, A2 is a subtype of B2. Sorry. Okay, and for the lists, um, uh, 
L notation P and element type A um, is a subtype of uh, list with annotation Q and element type B um, if well um, A is a subtype of B of course and um, the P is greater or equal to the Q yeah, point wise. And the sharing, um, you have also seen it already. So put it here. Sharing operation is, as before, um, Boolean can be shared freely. And for the pairs, so um, A, B, Shares with A1, B1. A2, B2. Um, if uh, A shares with A1, A2. And B shares with B1, B2. Um, okay, so for the list, so list of um, type A with annotation vector P shares with list annotated with R. <coughs> Element type A1, list annotated with vector Q, element type A2. If um, A shares with A1, A2, and um, P equals R plus Q, again, point-wise. Yeah, so you can, you have seen that in this example already, you can split the potential up point-wise, yeah, which makes sense if you yeah, think about what, what it means with the binomials. And the rules all stay the same. We just define like this new sharing and subtyping, and then the, the sharing and subtyping rules can just stay the same. Okay, so and if you're interested how this works for the multivariate case, then I can, um, I can uh, share a link. I can upload it to the um, Piazza. Uh, you can read about that. Okay, good. So that's um, all I have for today. Are there more questions? No, everybody's hungry now. Then, yeah, <laughs> let's go get lunch.
Uh, we have